You're listening to Blue Jays Nation Radio with Cam Lewis and Tyler Uremchuk, a member of the Nation Network of Podcasts and delivered by DoorDash. Welcome in. It's episode 94 of Blue Jays Nation in Seattle, aptly named Winless in Seattle. And Coomzy, uh, it just went from bad to worse on this road trip. And uh, I don't, every game was frustrating in a different way. And there were games where it's like, all right, here we go. I think they're going to like squeak this one out. And then it's just just gut punch after gut punch. And uh, that was just, yeah, wildly disappointing. Yeah, there seemed to be a really cursed feeling heading into that series in which I'm not sure if I came into it thinking that the four game sweep was going to be the outcome, but I did think it was going to be an ugly ride. I thought they would pull out one, specifically the Manoa start. But I mean, it kind of got progressively more frustrating, right? Because I don't think anybody thought the outcome was going to be all too different when you had the Anthony Banda, Casey Lawrence, you know, platoon start thing on Thursday. I think we all knew that was doomed from the start. But then, you know, after that, you have a a stripling and a Manoa start. You're like, yeah, maybe you can win one here. But then the pitching gets better and the bats just disappear. And then Sunday's game just felt completely cursed because you get a pretty, pretty solid start finally from like a random depth starter from Buffalo. There's bats, they come through and then weird shit happens. Vladdy's glove breaks uh, for the second time this season. Like, how does that keep happening? Gabe Moreno drops a pop-up. Like he's sound defensively. That doesn't really happen. Also, he shouldn't have had to catch that pop up. Like, why yeah. is why are one of the corner guys not calling him off? You had more than enough time to get in and get that ball. Like, don't let your catcher who's twirling around and a rookie catcher try to make that play. Like, it's easier to catch a ball running towards it. You learn that when you're like eight years old playing baseball. Um, yeah. There was. Yeah. And the glove thing. Like what? You're right. It's How does cursed. That it, was a, again? it was a curse. It's cursed. it's cursed. It reminds me of um, the first ever time I went down to Seattle. Uh, to watch the Jays was 2014 and they had just pulled off in Toronto a big series win against the Tigers and it was the the Sunday game before they traveled was that one that went like 18 19 innings and Jose Bautista hit a walk off and it seemed like everything was oh fuck yeah like we're you know we're flying they go into Seattle and get swept all three games and it was just even though they were coming in with momentum in that series in 2014, you could just kind of feel going into Seattle felt cursed. Mm -hmm. And it was the exact same this time. There wasn't momentum this time. They were in Oakland, they were bad and whatever, but it just felt cursed from the beginning. And this series was just so cursed. Like this, this, this team could not get into the all-star break quicker. Like I sincerely wish the all-star break was happening this week because they, this, this, this team needs a break real bad. Yeah, they, they really do. And it's obviously not an excuse or anything like that, but I also think mentally this team is probably not in a great spot considering everything that went on with bud and and kind of what's coming ahead there as well with a bunch of them flying out for the funeral as well. Like not an excuse. They're not going to make it an an excuse either, but it's context to to maybe how this team is feeling behind closed doors right now. And it certainly can't be easy uh, to be grinding through a trip like this where you're out on the coast. Yeah. It's a reminder. It's a reminder that like beyond playing a 162 baseball marathon is a physical grind. It's also a mental grind too. Like we, we know that happened with um, Bud's daughter. That's really fucked up. But then we also don't know what else is happening with other players and what, you know, life is throwing at them in certain situations. So try not to be overly critical and spazzing out, but as a fan, it's hard to kind of watch this right now and feel at all good about (laughs) what's going on. Yeah. Uh, Not at all. Just while we're talking about the way this series felt cursed, even and um, even even in that Manoa start where he goes seven and a third and he that wasn't just like a normal, like grind your way to get there. He was picking the Mariners apart. He racked up seven strikeouts at one point. I think he was in like the sixth or seventh inning and he only had like 80 pitches thrown like he was dominant. And then what happens? There was that little bleeder of a single that just gets through. And then Manoa makes basically his only bad pitch of the start. And it goes for a two run bomb and the team can't hit with runners in scoring position. They leave six guys on base in that game and they lose the ball game two to freaking one. Like again, it's a cruel sport because stuff like that will happen. And you always like to think that over the course of 162 games, you're also going to have games where you go up against an ace and you just somehow find a way to squeak in a couple of runs. Like that almost happened a few weeks ago when they went up against Corbin Burns, right? Where like that game ended up being a lot closer than you thought it'd be on the surface, even though Burns looked good. Um, But that just to me added to just how cursed this series felt. It's like, man, 
even when your ace had his absolute best stuff, nothing else could go your way. No, and it seems like that the Jays had a handful of games there in April where they were not firing in all cylinders and they still wound up winning a bunch of games. And it felt like some bullshit. And it does kind of feel like that's coming back around now. Like everything always balances itself out, right? Like think about last year's team or the 2015 team when they're, you know, killing it early on, but they keep losing games. Well, it all balances out later on in the season. Whereas right now for the Jays, they they really haven't been firing in all cylinders very much through April, May, June, and into early July now. But they still have like a decent record Mm -hmm. and it it does kind of seem like they were primed for a streak like this, like the starting pitching depth seemed thin. The bullpen is taxed. It was used so hard in April, so hard in June, and it's been used so hard with the challenge with the starting rotation. And then the offense is as always, it's very streaky. It's pretty one dimensional. It's, you know, a bunch of right-handed guys that swing a lot and they're thrown for cold streaks. And that's just how it is. So it's not overly surprising to see this team go into a funk. I don't think that they're bad. It's not that this Jays team is terrible. It's not that they're going to miss the playoffs for sure. And that they're going to lose every game for the rest of the year. But the reality reality is, is that this is a team prone to cold streaks. And while it's frustrating, it doesn't mean big picture that it's all over. Yeah. But they do have, they do have work to do. That's for sure. Like if they, I don't think making the playoffs is a guarantee. Um, There's other good teams in the league. Baltimore randomly is heating up. Seattle looks like a solid team. You know, the Chicago white Sox. I don't think they're as bad as the record indicates. There's more than six teams in the mix for a playoff spot. And they have work to do before the trade deadline, if they're going to get in. Because they haven't, they didn't have such a good first half. And mind you, there's still a few games left against Philly and Kansas City, but they haven't had such a good first half that they can, you know, just breeze in through the second half and make the playoffs like we all kind of thought. Yep. There's, they're going to have to put their foot on the gas and make some changes here. Yeah, they're right now tied with Seattle for the third wild card spot with Baltimore and Cleveland, both just two games back, Chicago, good two and God. a half back. That's sad, man. That, yeah. That's ugly to say out loud. Fucking Baltimore is two games back. But like, that, yeah. I mean, <laughs> over the course of the last 10 games, Baltimore has gained seven on them and the Mariners have gained eight now. So, I mean, it's pretty easy to see how you could go from comfortably sitting in a spot to the position you are now. Uh, let's do three up, three down for this series against the Mariners delivered by our friends at DoorDash. And uh, let's start with the downs. Obviously, that Banda the Banda Lawrence combo start. Um, we had a feeling that would be bad. It certainly was. That's two guys and, or that's maybe an experiment. Okay. You tried it once. We're good. Now you need to find a different way next time you need sort of a spot start. Yeah. Where's even the next place you go. They've tried hatch. Hatch was terrible. Yeah. I don't think anybody wants to see Thomas hatch make another start this season. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lawrence. I mean, I think if he pitches two innings, then it's fine. Uh, <laughs> that's fine, but I don't think you can get those two, the band, the Lawrence piggyback getting six innings or whatever in a, in like a good outing, but where do you go next? Like Max Castillo is the other one. He did quite well. I think he deserved another start. I'd much rather see Castillo starting than you say Kikuchi at this point. Um, but who else is there in AAA? Really nobody like there's, what are you going to call it? Like Anthony K somebody like that. Like there really isn't anybody, the one guy who was killing it in Buffalo. Well, Castillo was doing well, but Lawrence was killing it. He had a, like a sparkling ERA. I think it was below two when they called him up. Mm. And you know, the reality is, is they had a decent amount of eggs in the Nate Pearson basket and Pearson's probably not going to be healthy at all this year. Just, I mean, if we're being honest, so that the reality is, is you got to go out and get somebody that you want to, the, it would have been ideal if, the only need at the deadline was the bullpen and you can use all your bullets on getting good relievers. But now there's a pretty significant need for another starter. Yeah, it definitely does. And and I'll ask you a question about that a little bit later. Our second down for this series. um, I mean, no clutch really at, at any point in this series. And when they, I shouldn't say at any point, because then when they would get like the odd clutch moment, it would be something else that was their downfall. Like I think about, that Bichette dinger in the final game, yeah. right? And it puts them in the lead and you're like, here we go. That was a big moment. They're going to salvage this series. And then just more nonsense happens after it. But lack of clutch hitting in this entire series. Let's go through their runner in, with risk. Two for 20 in the first game. That's just absolutely embarrassing. One for six in the second game. That's not quite as bad, but still terrible. One for five in the third game. I mean, the fact that they even only had 
11 hitters in position in two games combined, just flat out isn't good enough for this offense. Um, and I, and I went over a game in there as well. I, I skipped over one, but the point is they did not hit well. Uh, they were two for 20 in the second game, sorry, three for six in the first game. Um, just not good enough with runners in scoring position. And I don't know who's at fault for that. Is it their approach? Like you mentioned a bunch of right-handed guys who just love free swinging. Is, is it the approach? That's the issue. Is it some sort of lineup construction? The way Montoya is putting this together every day. Like I, I don't have the answer for that. Yeah. Maybe at this point, I don't know. Like you're not going to change the roster all too much. Like these are the guys and this is yeah. who they are. Like they've, They've always had streaks where they go ice cold like this. It happens. And Seattle's a team that pitches reasonably well. Like, you know, one of the games they 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 get completely shut down as they're they're going up against Robbie Ray, who won the Cy Young last year. And as much as we like to joke about, oh, Robbie Ray is completely lost now that he doesn't have Pete Walker. Well, in his last six starts, he's thrown a combined almost 40 innings and has allowed four runs. His ERA is 0.91 in his last six starts. So Robbie Ray's clearly figured it out. And I mean, yeah, Seattle's pitching is decent. Like they're not um, it was the same thing in Oakland too. Like there's one thing Oakland does reasonably well is they pitch. Okay. So I don't think this is a, like a complete need to get really anxious about the lineup specifically. It's not like they went up against guys that had like a nine ERA and couldn't hit it all. Yeah. But you know, the lineup's gone cold. We all know that they're prone for cold streaks because they're a swing happy lineup. It's very right-handed. There's a game plan against these guys you can execute. But I don't know, maybe it is time to shake up the lineup. I don't know if that really makes a difference. Uh, last year, I remember they moved Bo into the fourth spot where he was worried less about on base and more about cashing guys in. Maybe that'll help. I mean, you're kind of just shuffling deck chairs at that point. I just think basically like it all comes down to the pitching. That's really what it is for me. Yeah. And that's fair. Um, the third down we have is just the fact that it felt cursed, right? Um, you, you get a couple of times where the Mariners get some clutch home runs, the Moreno air, the Vladdy glove thing falling apart. Like even if just one of the Moreno air or the Vladdy glove thing happened, they find a way to bring that game. They're going to extra innings at least, right? Like they, they're getting another shot. They're getting some more ABs. Um, but just an unbelievably bad luck series, bad baseball. Like I tweeted that this series was cursed. And a bunch of people were like, it's not cursed. They're just a bad baseball team. No, they're not. And I'm, I'm not at the point where I'm willing to accept that. And I read the article that was up on our site. Um, you know, it's time to argue Charlie Montoyo and the basis that you can't sit here and do nothing. So you need to do something and firing a manager is just an easy thing to do. But I just, I don't know, maybe I'm just too optimistic. Maybe I'm too stupid. I don't know what the reasoning is, but I just don't know if firing a manager is magically going to fix the issues with this team. I think getting some bullpen arms, getting consistent starting pitching is what's going to allow them to win games and they're going to get hot. Their bats are going to get going. I'm still very confident that at another point this season, because I know we already got one earlier, we're going to see the bats get red hot and they're going to win eight or nine in a row. And they're going to have the complete opposite of what we're seeing right now. It's going to happen at some point. I'm still convinced of that. And I just don't think mad firing Charlie is magically going to make that happen right now. I'm just not sold on it. Like if the argument is, okay, why are you firing Montoyo? Because you have to fire the manager. Well, I, I'm just not sold. That's a smart way to operate your organization. I'm not. Yeah. The other question is, is if they're going to fire Charlie is who comes in right away are you going external and you bringing in like a veteran? Like there's always been talk like um, Eric Wedge is that name from Cleveland. They brought up 9 million times. Then you have a name like Joe Girardi or John Madden who have recently been fired this year, who have world series pedigree. Like, are you going to bring in a veteran like that? Are you going to promote from within? Are you going to do, you know, John Schneider is the name that we've always kind of yeah. thought would be the next manager because he managed um, the core guys down in double a New Hampshire. Um, is firing Charlie going to fire them up or is it going to just make them, you know, burn them out for the year? Is it, is it cause, cause everyone thinks, okay, you fire your coach and that gives the team a spark, but you, you only really remember the times where a manager or a coach got fired mid season and the team exploded, but you don't remember like, uh, there was one season, I think it was when the Leafs fired Randy Carlisle and they brought in that completely random interim coach. I think it was Hornacek, something like that. Okay. And they went like five and 20 and one the rest of the way. And they weren't, they were, they were bad with Carlisle, but they were reasonably in the mix, like 10th in the Eastern conference kind of thing. And then they fired the guy and then the team just quit. You know, I don't I don't know if the Jays are going to quit if Charlie gets fired, but I don't think it's a guarantee that it fires them up. I don't know if 
Charlie leaving is going to make them rah, rah, rah. We got a win or if it's just going to be a bummer. If it was 100% of the time you fire the coach and then they, a team turns it around, 25 teams would fire their managers every single season. Like it's not just a magic switch. And some people, I don't know, maybe they're going to call us homers, tell us we're idiots, blah, 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 which is all totally fair. And I, I believe I, I at least am both of those. I just don't know. Like, I just, I, I, I don't, I don't disagree that it's an idea to consider. Like, I mean, when you have an awful stretch like this, someone's got to be held accountable. That's fine. But I just don't know if the team's going to respond in a positive way to that. Given the way things are going right now, it just seems that vibes are terrible. Yeah. Um, the vibes are absolutely brutal right now. So uh, let's hope they turn it around. Let's do the up from this series against Seattle, even though there's not a ton. Uh, we talked a little bit about that great Manoa start. We really don't need to go back there. He was excellent. He was tremendous. And he's being named an all-star, um, which is a great thing to see. Like if you would have told me at the beginning of the season, that one Blue Jays pitcher would be an all-star this year. He probably would have been my third guest behind Barrios and Gosman. Um, but you've been a guy who's championed him as this staff's ace for a long time now. So kudos to you. Your boy's getting an all-star nod. Yeah, I've said since the beginning of the season that Alec Minot is the ace, and I, and I believe that to be accurate. I really do hope we see him pitch to Alejandro Kirk at some point in that game. That'd be fantastic. I think we will, but all-star games are weird. You never know, but yeah. having four all-stars in the game is quite cool. They also have Alejandro Kirk is the first time they've had, but these, they've, all, they've only had like a handful of catchers um, in the all-star game ever. And Kirk's the first one to be a starter wow. in Blue Jays franchise history. Starting That's all-star awesome. as a catcher. Crazy. No, wow. one, no one saw this coming at the beginning of the year. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's put a pin in that because our second yeah, up, because yeah, yeah, we need to do all three ups. We're jumping all over the place, Kimsey. Yeah, uh, we're, we're ADHD this morning to the extreme. Castillo, does he deserve another start? Are you confident he will get another start? Yeah, absolutely, 100%. Like, he's the only one of these, these, these combinations. You've got Hatch, Lawrence, and Castillo now have been your spot starters, and Castillo is the only one who's done anything close yeah. to a good start. He does four and one-third. Three runs, but only one's earned because the Vladdy glove thing just completely pulled the air out of the balloon. Uh, he's got a 2.30 ERA all told uh, in the big leagues as a pitcher. Sure, why not? Like his stuff seems kind of hittable, but if he can do Gustavo Chassin right now and just have a handful of good starts before the league figures him out, fuck it. Like just ride this until until it breaks. That's what yeah. they need right now. And almost not, not a same scenario at all, but uh, well, like we talked about Sergio Romo, right? And I was like, okay, even if this guy comes in yeah. and gives you three, four, five, six quality outings before he implodes for one. And I wouldn't even say he imploded, but he did give up two earned the other day and three hits failed to record an out against the Mariners. Um, but with Castillo, like if he can just come in and you have what, seven series now, I think until the, the trade deadline, if he can just come in and give you three or four more good outings, even if he falls mm -hmm. apart once after that, this guy, if he can just bridge the gap to the deadline for when you can maybe, you know, for when maybe the market opens up and you can go get help, that's all you need of him. You do not need him. It's not like the Jays are sitting here right now and being like, well, damn it, he's going to be starting in October in that wild guard series. Like, that's not happening. You just need him to bridge this little bit of a gap. Well, the challenge is, is that, um, <laughs> Now a bunch of other teams are in the mix. So we're hoping that by the time the trade deadline rolled around, that a bunch of these middling teams, Baltimore's and Cleveland's and Seattle's and such, we're going to be like, oh, we're not in the mix. We suck. We're going to sell. Well, now <laughs> that's not the case. And they're right within striking distance. So that makes it even more difficult to go out and acquire guys because there's more teams buying. So they just badly need to convert on one of these like waiver wire bullshit pickups where you're not giving up your top prospect to receive a good, not great reliever because that's what the market's going to demand now. Well, not necessarily, but you know, that's kind of, the it looks like it's trending now. that way though. Yeah. That's the path we're heading down. There's, there's more decent teams than bad teams right now, which is very different than last year. Yeah. All right. Uh, the third up is the fact that aside from Manoa, there are three other yeah. all-stars, Vladdy and Springer, very predictable. They would have been top of the list. If you had to guess who the Jays all-stars would be at the start of the year, but Alejandro Kirk, it's great to see a guy, um, one so loved by the fan base and uh, a young player who comes out of nowhere and is getting getting some props for it. Right. Like I know the the fan vote and the all star thing, like it's been getting a lot of talk online about kind of what a joke it can be at points and how there are some really good players not getting the all star nod simply because the fan vote was kind of skewed. But Kirk is not one of those players who is just skewed by the fan vote or anything like that. This dude legitimately deserves to be an all-star. Um, if you look at his numbers over the course of the season, they are absolutely tremendous. If you look at his numbers recently, they, they've fallen off a little bit, 
But, you know, in his last 30 games, he's batting 313. There's not a lot of catchers around the American League who are capable or have shown this season they're capable of putting up those numbers. A well-deserved all-star nod for Alejandro Kirk. Yeah, Kirk's the best catcher in the American League, perhaps in Major League Baseball right now. He's good defensively, hits quite well. His OPS is 876. Um, baseball reference has him at 3.1 wins above replacement. It's been a fantastic season. It's kind of funny because... You know, back in March when there was talk about, oh, the Jays are in the mix for Jose Ramirez. And we're like, yeah, let's go all in. He was the one that everyone was down to trade because they thought Gabe Moreno was so good. He was so good. He was going to be able to step in and be amazing. But the Jays go ahead and don't pull the trigger on that trade. Um, Kirk sticks around and he's been probably their best player this year. Uh, it's it's super cool to see. Yeah, like I said, um, first starting first starting catcher in an all-star game in Blue Jays history. The, that's awesome. wildly impressive. Yeah. And, they've, and the Jays have had good catchers in the past, but kudos to Kirk for being, I think, um, the best catcher in Major League Baseball at this point. But the one shitty thing here is that I think if you're the Jays, you don't necessarily want to be sending four guys out West right after you were out West during the break. And then they got to come back out East. That's not necessarily ideal. I would be surprised. Since- I wouldn't Especially be surprised George if Springer, Springer doesn't go. Yeah, I, yeah. I think uh, that that's one guy who you maybe have circled. You know, he's kind of been there, done that with the All Star game a few times. He hasn't been 100 percent healthy all season either. I, I think that could be one where he kind of just goes, you know what? Thanks, but no thanks. I'm going to stay in Toronto and really take four full days to heal up, where I don't need to go on a cross country flight at any point or cross continent flight, I should say. Um, yeah, I, I would say 50-50 Springer goes is kind of how it sounds. They were talking about it on the broadcast a little bit. Too. What's the protocol for that? In the NHL, the guy gets suspended for a game. Like Alex Ovechkin always skips it and he always yeah. gets suspended. What's the protocol in Major League Baseball? Do they get suspended I mean, or it's just... I don't think it? so. I think you can just not go, but... You just say even, you're injured, right? Yeah, just say you're injured. And if Springer wants the rest and Major League Baseball is like, oh, you're getting suspended a game, then don't okay. play him the last game against Kansas City. Like you shouldn't need him or for even that the game. First game out, it doesn't really matter. Like this guy sits once every four or five games anyway. Yeah. It's not a big deal. <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Or just like have him swing in his last at bat against Kansas City and wince a little bit, and then send it to the league and be like, ah, yeah. he tweaked. Run, something. Out, run out a ground ball and just come up with that excruciating pain face, and then it's like, <laughs> ah, yeah, you don't have to go to LA. You're fine. Don't worry about it. And it's it's all just a facade, but they don't obviously like us as fans. We have to spend oh. four days of the All Star break freaking Melting. out about if George Springer's Melting actually down. hurt or not. Melting down. <laughs> the real worst case scenario, of course, is that he does go. <laughs> hurts himself in the fucking all-star game, but that's not something I just say out loud. I shouldn't have put that into the universe. That's good. Yeah. With all the cursed stuff that's been happening over the last week, uh, you should not be throwing that stuff out there. Um, So just going elsewhere around the AL East here around the American league as a whole, I should say with the Jays now uh, firmly in a wild card race, uh, it was a bit of a weird week. The Rays couldn't beat the Reds. Like what is going on there? Like that is incredibly puzzling uh yeah i mean for some reason these uh these really bad teams are giving the supposedly good teams the fits i thought tampa was ready to go on a streak they looked um they looked really quite good in those final few games against the jays in that yeah. Canada five game series but maybe they didn't actually look that good the jays are just that bad um and then yeah tampa goes ahead and plays cincinnati and goes and gets swept and then elsewhere in the american league Um, the Yankees and Red Sox played a four gamer and split it. And the Baltimore Orioles apparently are unstoppable as they've won eight games for the first time since I think 2014. Wow. Is is the tweet that I saw. It was, uh, yeah, that's their first winning streak in ages. So now we have the Orioles in the wild card race, which is unfortunate. So now there's, 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 yeah, there's a handful of teams within striking distance. The Jays are tied for the final spot there in sixth with Seattle. They're both 45 and 42. And then Baltimore's right there, 43 and 44. Cleveland's right there, 41 and 42. The White Sox underachieving, 41 and 43. And then I don't know if Texas is really in the mix at 39 and 44. I don't know about the Angels either. Oh, no, the Angels are well out, 38 and 49. So we can discount that. But yeah, it's a it's a more competitive wild card race than we thought. And that makes life a lot more difficult for trade deadline, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it absolutely yep. does. Yep. Um, when there's more buyers and less sellers, that is not ideal if you're one of those teams in the race. All right, coming up here for Toronto, it is the series against the Philadelphia Phillies, a quick bang, bang, one, two game series in Toronto. Those thankfully they're back 
at the Rogers Center. Um, it sounds like, and, and they were talking about this a little bit on the broadcast, and I was just digging around to see if we got confirmation this morning, but I don't see it. I think there's a chance Gosman plays one of these two. Yeah, they have been talking about that throughout the weekend, that the plan wasn't to put Gosman on the injured list because he should be available to pitch either the first game of the Kansas City series or uh, one of these games against Philly. Mm-hmm. So, but at the very least, since there's an off day on Monday, we won't have to see the uh, Lawrence platoon spot start situation. It would line up to be normal days rest for Stripling and Manila in this series, unless they want to insert Gosman and give somebody else some rest. One of those two guys. Yeah. And uh, Barrios coming up right away as well. So the Jays should be able to get through these last six games until, uh, until the all-star break without having to do any sort of a weird spot start for anyone. Um, Barrios got the last game of the Oakland series, which right, means, yeah, right. it, so it would be, yeah, it would be normal rest for Barrios. So they could go Barrios, Gosman, and then Stripling Manoa, Stripling Manoa, Castillo, Castillo, and then end it with another Barrios before the all-star break. Or, or the, I mean, another idea, if you think Gosman's ready to go and you're in a spot where you're like, Hey, every game matters right now, which is insane. You could go Gosman, then Barrios. If he's ready to go tomorrow, Gosman, Barrios, Gosman gets an extra start on the 17th against KC. But then that's a, that's a lot of rest for Barrios. That's a lot of time to accumulate rust because his last game would have been Wednesday in Oakland. And then you're having him rest all the way until the following Wednesday. So I don't know if that'd be ideal for his routine. Yeah, that's a good point. It would be a week off. And then even if you started him again, the first game back from the all-star break in Boston, that would be another nine days off. So, I, I mean, it's one of those things where they obviously know the player better than we do. Like, does he want, the uh does he want the extra rest is that something that would maybe help him or you're right does it just totally get him out of his routine a big two against the philadelphia phillies though interleague play the phillies have one more win than the blue jays but they're still missing bryce harper like this is a uh this is a beatable team and and i don't know right now at this point i don't even give a shit they could be playing the yankees for these two games and you just have to win you have to find a way to get the job done and get a victory here and snap out of this cold streak you have to get a win here for sure, for sure. The Phillies kind of are Blue Jays East. It seems they're a top heavy team. They have a lot of, they have a lot of pretty good players, um, but they're only 46 and 40, which is a bit disappointing. Um, so they're kind of the same style of team that's underachieved quite a bit. They fired their manager, Joe Girardi, when they were 22 and 29. And I guess to contradict our thing earlier, where we mm-hmm. thought this doesn't always happen. Uh, they brought in the new guy, Rob Thompson, and they are 40 are 24 and 11 cents. So more, uh, more validation for uh, Gideon's point about firing Charlie, because it's the thing to do. I'm, I'm still a little skeptical, but again, I understand the logic. They could rally. I don't know. The Phillies seem to have done that, but no guarantee the Jays also do. There are no guarantees in baseball. Um, and we'll see if the Jays can find a way to snap out of this slump here coming up against the Philadelphia Phillies. Six home games to go until the all-star break. Coomsey, how many wins would it take to have you feeling confident about this team again? How confident is confident? Like, I felt a little uneasy about them for a while. I don't think they're bad but I don't think they're amazing. I think they're flawed. I think they're going to make the playoffs, but if they go and do like a one in five stretch here, then I will not be confident that they make the playoffs anymore. Van has them at 80%. You would imagine that number drops a lot closer to 50%. If they go under 500 over this stretch of games against the Phillies and Royals, you would imagine fan bases probably calm down a little bit. If they go something like five and one or Hey, who knows yeah. six and zero. Oh, although I don't think anyone's really expecting that here over this stretch, but if they can go five and one, I think people all of a sudden maybe start to feel a little bit more confident. And I think for the psyche of this team, that could be important as well. Heading into the all-star break. We'll be back in just a few short days though, to talk a little bit. Maybe we'll talk a little like deadline strategy and things like that. Eh? Yeah. And then we also got the draft right around the corner too. It's uh, the first rounds next Sunday. I think next wow. Sunday is next Monday, something like that. It's, it's they, they've, mixed, they've mixed it in with the all-star break now, which I think is quite nice. And actually something interesting on that topic that's happening right now as we're recording is uh, Ken Rosenthal confirming that the Royals are acquiring Drew Waters and Andrew Hoffman and a third minor leaguer from the Braves in exchange for the 35th pick in Sunday's draft, draft pick trading. Oh, that's the thing now. Wow. That's exciting. Yeah, cool. So we'll see. Maybe the Jays wow. move a draft pick. Do you imagine? 
they, 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 they trade off like a roster player now for a first round pick in the year's draft. Like how people would respond to that. Well, the, if, if this is a thing, the Jays have a lot of compensatory draft picks this year from uh, Robbie Ray and Marcus Semyon. So maybe this is going to become the NHL when we see them move a prospect plus a first round pick for a quality starter. Ah, one can dream, Coomzy. One can dream. You enjoy these two games against Philly. We'll chat later. I will try. Best wishes. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to Blue Jays Nation Radio, a member of the Nation Network of Podcasts and delivered by DoorDash. Don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from to never miss an episode.